It is a great pleasure to welcome today in this virtual Rome Med Dialogue Filippo Grandi, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Filippo has been engaged in refugees and humanitarian work for more than 30 years and is leading the High Commission for Refugees in this moment of great distress in which borders are closing and vulnerable people are suffering the most. Filippo is absolutely not new at Romed, is absolutely not new at ISPI, but absolutely most welcome as usual. Uh, Filippo, we will have, uh, first of all, a, a conversation, um, you and me, and then if you agree, we'll get a few questions from the audience at the end of our conversation. Uh, we are facing a health challenge which affects the most vulnerable. Refugees and displaced people are, of course, among vulnerable population, even in normal time. Can you give us a picture of the impact of, of the pandemic on refugees and on the work of, your, of the High Commission? Thank you, Paolo. Grazie, and thanks for having me here. Uh, this is an important question because, uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, whichever group of people around the world you ask this question about, the reply is that they have been impacted. The reality is that we have all been impacted by the pandemic, by the coronavirus. Um, how have the refugees, the displaced people, the people that my organization works for, about 80 million of them around the world, how have they been impacted? I would say from the health point of view, we were extremely worried in the beginning. And if you have in your mind the images of refugee camps in Bangladesh, the Rohingya refugee camps, super crowded, no water, no facilities, um, or some situations in Africa, the initial images were that the coronavirus would be rampant in those places. The reality is that from the health point of view, the impact has been perhaps a bit less uh, visible and impactful in those situations, partly because we were able in those situations to put up very quickly a lot of measures to prevent and contain in agreement with the governments of those countries. But uh, we have seen an impact uh, in other situations. Take the Venezuelan refugees. They live in vast urban slums in Latin America, and those were immensely impacted by COVID-19. And so were the refugees living among the local population. Same in some cities in Africa, in Asia, and other places. So a mixed picture, I would say. But where the impact has been really very strong and perhaps even earlier than other groups has been on the social and economic side. Lockdowns necessary, especially in certain phases of the response, have of course created, as we all know, for everybody, a lot of other problems. Schools closed, we can talk about that later. We've work so hard in the last few years to ensure that refugee children can go to school, we have slowly increased the percentage of those children that are enrolled. This has been a severe blow to those efforts, the closure of schools. And uh, economic impact. Most of the refugees, the displaced, but in many cases also many people that are hosting the refugees often the refugees are in very poor areas of countries, all of these people live usually in a, in a very informal economy. Jobs are precarious, jobs are based on daily wages. These are the first, this is the first um, layer of the economy that disappears literally in lockdowns. So this has been devastating. So we've done something about that, and again, we can talk about this, but this is what worries us most going forward and thinking of the future when hopefully the 
pandemic is over, but we will have to deal with the longer term consequences of it among this very vulnerable population. I want to add quickly one more point, which is specific, and again, we can elaborate more. Closures of borders. This, again, is, is a very understandable measure that many countries have taken. The reality is that it has also impacted people that are fleeing for their lives because they escape from war, from persecution, from discrimination, from violence. So on the one hand, you save lives by closing borders, probably, but you expose others to uh, very high risks, including to their lives. Difficult dilemmas that we've worked with governments to try and address. Filippo, will you mention this point right now, but will uh, closing of border as a necessity, as you mentioned, will, will it be used as an excuse to reduce the protection given to refugees in the short term? Unfortunately, I think in some cases it has been, and now it's a bit early to say because we're still in the emergency phase, especially with this second wave in Europe and other places. But going forward, I fear that this might be used. Now, there's about a uh, hundred countries that uh, have allowed some space for asylum seekers. Let's put it that way. Some exceptional measures, quarantine, tests, etc., and they can still uh, follow and can still seek asylum, enter the territory. But uh, there's about 67 countries and, and you know, we have a dashboard that we follow every day, literally online, it's public knowledge. 67 countries that have not established this, let's say, safeguards for the refugees and asylum seekers. So we're working with them. In some cases, you know, it's very difficult. I fully understand small countries and so forth, but there are ways around. I'll give you only one quick example. Take a country that hosts one of the largest refugee populations in the world, Uganda, a country of about 40 million people, not very wealthy, with few resources, very generous though. In, uh, in March or April, they had a big inflow of refugees from Congo, where, as usual, there was unfortunately a spike in fighting. So we negotiated because the Ugandans were facing also a corona pandemic. Uh, 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 emergency. So we negotiated and to a very complex system of special quarantine sites, we managed to convince Uganda took thousands of people in. I think this is just one a positive example that should be observed by much wealthier countries that have not done the same. Impressive. Uh, you mentioned we are all, <clears throat> most of us are locked down. Uh, in most countries, but almost every country is trying to keep schools open because education is crucial for the future. Uh, there is an uh, intense debate in Italy as well, as you may know. Uh, my question is, how are you addressing the challenge of guaranteeing education in this time of emergency in refugees camps? It's a, it's a big challenge and I, I do feel for those governments that have to make those difficult decisions because somehow we have to be with them in respect of these populations and participate in those discussions. But um, um, uh, wherever possible, we're telling governments, if you host refugees, and you know, we should not always think about Europe um, North America, where, you know, there are means, there are solutions possible to an extent. We should think of countries with much bigger refugee populations and less resources. How they, are they going to deal with that? And I think my concern is that the lockdowns, as, as I said earlier, has pushed back this agenda of including refugees displaced people in education systems. Remember 2015, 16, when all those Syrian refugees came to Europe? You know, many families were telling us at that time that one of the reasons why they decided to leave Lebanon or Turkey or even Syria itself was the realization that kids would never be able to go to school again. We had not invested even in education programs in Lebanon and Turkey, as we did later 
when we realized that that was a huge gap. You know, in an emergency, you always think of food, of medicine, of health, but education is, uh, is very vital as well, especially for refugees. So the fact that now they've been in many places excluded from school is disastrous. And it is a particularly bad for girls. We have conducted a very thorough survey. We estimated of all the girls that were in primary and secondary school, refugee girls, who have had to stay out because of lockdowns, only 50% will go back. Why? Because th this is where the economic impact combines with the education impact. Families are so impoverished that they need these girls to work. And sometimes they exploit them. And sometimes they oblige them to marry before they're, the, you know, at a very young age, forced marriages, because that's the only economic coping mechanism of the family. These are very tragic situations that are all connected with the lack of education. So we're really telling not only governments, but also big institutions like the World Bank, even the, the International Monetary Fund, you know, for the first time I reached out even to them to say, when you design packages to salvage the economies of countries affected by lockdowns, don't forget that some of those countries host large number of refugees. They somehow, let me be very simple, they deserve more assistance also for the refugees, not just for the nationals, including in the education sector. But are countries like Jordan, which is uh, heavily affected, or Lebanon as well, heavily affected by their own crisis, are they receiving more support or not? I'm get getting back to what you were mentioning right now. There are some countries where this uh, notion that if you um, host large numbers of refugees, um, you should qualify for additional development assistance, basically. Not humanity, not our little assistance, the long-term big assistance, development assistance. That notion has now been growing a lot in the past few years. I think that the, the big crisis of 2015 was the beginning of that reflection. You know, the World Bank has established a special refugee window in their IDA program. This is the program for poor countries. And it's not a small window, it's, it was $2 billion in IDA 18, it's $2.2 billion in IDA 19. And what we're doing now, we're telling them, you know, have a COVID window as well, something I, I'm simplifying the more complex, but in your COVID packages include the refugee component. Actually, uh, it's difficult to uh, because these are very technical matters because, you know, but, you know, these are game changers in terms of refugee assistance, in terms of the ability that we have to mobilize resources to convince countries to keep refugees and eventually to find solutions for them. So I think that COVID is a blow to some of the gains, but could be an accelerator for some of these solutions. John, uh, Filippo, you mentioned the World Bank, uh, and the World Bank is expecting up to 150 million of new poor due to the pandemic. Uh, and that means that in just one year, one year, the new poor will overcome the number of refugees or forcibly displaced people, which is at a record level already. And let me get back to the issue of crowding out of funding. Will it become, with this number of new poor, not refugees, new poor, will it become increasingly difficult to keep refugees and the displaced on the international agenda and within donors' right sides? Uh, I, I think undoubtedly there will be huge challenges, and not just for refugees but for many groups that could be considered married. You know, refugees have always this huge disadvantage that they're not nationals. So they don't vote, they don't, yeah. they're not a constituency for governments that have to make these incredibly difficult decisions, you know, on who gets what subsidy and when and for how long. So what we are trying to do in this context, besides our usual humanitarian work, is to become advocate for these groups in the big discussion on how you respond to the economic crisis. This is what we're trying to do. And I have to tell you, 
And I have to tell you that, in, you know, the, the, the Bretton Woods institutions, um, whatever their reputation in terms of helping the poor or uh, really being on the side of the poor countries, have been phenomenal in this context. And I can really see how the discourse has, is changing there. It will take time because, you know, the discourse there means that it needs to be translated into solid financial instruments that can be used. And this is complex, but the discourse is coming. I think there is a realization and I think that this realization has been promoted, has been facilitated by the sustainable development goals, by the idea that no one must be left behind, that if you leave somebody behind, then it's, it's not just wrong. It's a liability for everybody else. And the pandemic has given us the best example of that. You leave somebody out of medical care, that person, first of all, it's wrong to do it, but then that person can become a danger for the others. So I think that, you know, the pandemic gave us some, some opportunities to reflect on these global approaches that are sometimes um, stigmatized and ridiculed by some of our less visionary politicians. Uh, I don't ask you who you mean, uh, but uh, let me, let me um, uh, get to the issue of conflict. Uh, because we all know that one of the major uh, reasons that make people escape and become refugees uh, is conflict. And let me ask you on the gloom side and, not, and the positive side, if you see any conflict that is on the verge of resolving any sign of hope for refugees, and on the other end, is there any particular crisis that you think we are still underestimating right now that could evolve into a major crisis contributing to a major refugee flows? So, positive side and uh, <laughs> Maybe I'll start with the negative. You know, I, I, if I can just describe to you what I have been doing in the last four days. <laughs> you know, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh, okay? Um, Ethiopia and the, the Tigray uh, conflict. Um, elections in Côte d'Ivoire, which um, um, hopefully they are being put back on a good track, but have already caused some exit of refugees in West Africa. Uh, Northern Mozambique, nobody's talking about that. There is a vicious conflict there between the government, the army, and some very, very uh, radical groups of the kind that we have seen in other places. Yesterday, there were horrifying reports of beheadings of civilians by these groups, something that we have seen widespread in, in the Sahel, for example. So, you know, the, unfortunately, the list of conflicts, some of which we all know, some of which are much less visible, uh, continues and doesn't seem to, to decline. And, um, and uh, I think that to respond to an aspect of your question, it's the combination between conflicts that either last forever or emerge together with growing poverty and inequality, which the pandemic will probably increase, social issues. This is a recipe, I'm afraid, you know, I'm not usually an alarmist, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a recipe for more population movements of the very complex nature that we have seen, that we have seen, for example, arriving in Italy, just to, to mention one country, but arriving across the Mediterranean to stay in the theme of this conference. So that is something that we need to carefully watch and address in its various components, which by the way, include climate change and other factors. And, but to go to your other part of the question, which I prefer, are there any <laughs> signs of hope? Well, <laughs> I have to be very prudent there, but I do believe, well, first of all, we have to see how this ceasefire between Armenia and Azerbaijan plays out. It has very complex challenges for the Armenians in particular, but it could have some promise for getting out of one of the longest displacement crises we've been dealing with. We've been in those two countries since 1992, permanently waiting for some solution to happen. But more, uh, perhaps more, in my opinion, even more relevant or 
um, big is what is happening in Sudan and South Sudan. You know, in Sudan, change of government through a peaceful revolution of the people, amazing. I, I don't know how much this is known, but it was amazing what happened last year in Sudan. In South Sudan, a much more challenge, a, a, a equally challenging peace process between the factions. Both processes are going in a good direction, but they're not yet there. But we have already, I have already called on the leaders of the two countries and said, between the two of you, you either host or have produced seven million refugees and displaced. I'm talking about Sudanese, South Sudanese, but also from neighboring countries in Sudan. Why don't we use this space that you have created politically and launch an initiative to try and resolve these problems? Some people may want to go back home. Some may wish to stay where they are. The response was quick, immediate, and positive. So we're going to work on that. Naturally, I say all this, and yesterday we had the first 10, 11,000 Ethiopian refugees arriving in Sudan from Tigray. So, you know, it's a region where, and in many other regions is the same, where you never know what's happening next. But I think that, especially if this Ethiopia crisis recedes, we have there the foundations for a very interesting uh, exercise of solutions, which, by the way, has a positive impact on Europe as well, because uh, uh, don't forget that there was a moment, not now, where most of the people crossing into Italy, for example, many were of Sudanese nationality from the Darfur areas and so forth. So, you know, I, I say this because even in the worst moments, we should never lose what I call the solutions reflex and try to work on that, which is a very political exercise, by the way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me move a little bit to Europe. You mentioned Europe already, uh, but let me get uh, deeper into that because uh, this September, the European Commission proposed its new pact on migration and asylum, which somehow lowers protections for asylum seekers. And meanwhile, some European countries continue to be free riders in terms of respecting the rights of refugees and asylum seekers. Do you think the European Union is moving in the right direction? That's a big question, Paolo. I think, uh, uh, I think uh, the Commission has made a good move. Let me respond like this. I think that the pact on asylum and migration, which by the way is still a proposal, is, not, is nothing approved because it's a proposal by the Commission to the Member States. Tomorrow, I think the Justice and Home Affairs Ministers of the European Union are meeting to discuss. Uh, and uh, in my, uh, my feedback from Brussels is that this is a discussion that will take several months, most likely. It's a difficult one. And doing it at the time of pandemic is not ideal, but you know, we can't stop everything. We have to continue. And we have contributed to the pact. We have given a lot of advice, and so has IOM, the International Organization for Migration. We work very closely, the two of us, with the European institutions. My uh, readout of the pact, as it was proposed, is that you, you say it reduced protection. Well, in some areas, perhaps it is down to the minimum acceptable, but by and large, with some technical qualifications, our redoubt is that if the pact was approved as it is, which is not a guarantee at all, we don't know that, but if, if it was approved, it would be positive. It would be positive because it would allow Europe to improve the way it receives and deals with the people crossing the Mediterranean, not just the Mediterranean, by the way, you know, going to the Canary Islands, going overland into the Balkans and God knows, maybe we will see other entry points in the future. So I think it is, it is good. It is complex. There are some, you know, for political reasons, in order to try and make it acceptable, I told the Commissioner Johansson, who is, you know, the, the commissioner that really leads this, that, you know, she has excellent lawyers because the way they formulated some of the solutions are so subtle and complex. That is good because it may make the acceptance easier, but 
the implementation will be a big challenge, especially where it comes to this solidarity concept, right? We share more the arrivals, which has been the big challenge so far. But, uh, you know, we, we are making ourselves available to Europe and European member states if they approve this pact, which I hope they will, to make it, uh, uh, you know, accelerated procedures, you mentioned that. They're, they're useful, they're important. We have to have accelerated procedures. And we have proposed for years to Europe how you can do them and maintain the integrity of the protection aspect of it. So it is possible. The very complicated question of returning rejected asylum seekers to their countries. This is a question that also in Italy has been discussed forever and ever. Now, we are not involved because these are not refugees. These are people that are recognized as not being refugees. But are there any ways that collectively with countries that receive them back, we can organize this so that the credibility of the asylum process is, is maintained? And maybe there are other channels that need to be developed for economic migrants to move. You know, it's a complex issue, but I think that uh, uh, I don't know if Europe will be on the right track, but if they miss this opportunity to have a pact that binds them together, then they will be on the wrong track for sure. This for Europe. Now let's move uh, quickly to United States. Uh, I know you cannot uh, comment on uh, uh, internal politics of, of states, uh, which are members of your organization, but uh, will a new administration in Washington make your job easier? Well, I, I, of course, I don't comment on, on elections. Uh, this is not my job in any, any shape and form. I have, however, publicly congratulated uh, uh, President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect uh, Kamala Harris. And I have publicly said and stated that we hope to work with them on the refugee and displacement file. Um, and uh, I think we need to be a little bit sophisticated in analyzing the US position in this respect. The US is our biggest partner in every respect. Uh, if you, you know, my organization in 2020, this year, has available $5 billion. This is our it's not our budget, but it is our income, if you wish, mostly governments and other sources. The United States account for almost two billion of that, which is the highest contribution they have ever made to, to us as an organization. So support of the US for humanitarian operations of UNHCR has been very high. I, 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 you know, this doesn't mean, it has not been the same for WHO, for, uh, the Population mm. Fund for UNRWA, we know that. But for us, you know, every organization is different. We have enjoyed exceptional support at every level. We have more challenging discussions on two other fronts with the US. One is the, what we call the resettlement program. In, in countries like in Italy, it is called humanitarian corridors. In, you know, the resettlement is the technical name, moving refugees from one country to the other because this administration, and this is their prerogative has almost zero doubt their resettlement program. And then there is the complex discussion about their southern border, Central America, refugees, asylum seekers coming through the border. Now, the border discussion has been difficult with every single administration, or rather complex and challenging, but we continue to have it. Resettlement, I hope that the Biden administration will do what it has said it will do, which is to restore previous quotas and even go above previous quotas, which were by far the largest in the world and that were extremely important. So I hope that that will work. Uh, let me remind uh, our audience that uh, we will uh, pick up a few questions very soon. I still have a couple of questions for the High Commissioner, but please uh, feel free to send uh, your question on our chat. Uh, Filippo, uh, you mentioned already this issue, but I want to go get back to it. Uh, global challenges, global approaches, global answer. Uh, the pandemic is a global challenge, which would require a global response. Uh, and yet we are witnessing some difficulties in coordinating such a response. 
Uh, migration too is a global challenge as human mobility knows no border, and we could say the same of climate emergency. Uh, do you think we are learning the lesson? Uh, is there any real hope uh, for developing a cooperative approach at the global level for these global challenges beyond words? I mean, we keep listening and hearing to words of global response, but do you see this uh, operational. Uh. Can I be honest? Not yet. Not yet. You know, I thought that at the beginning of the pandemic, this would be in a way a stimulus to that, given the urgency and the, you know, if, if we don't understand through the pandemic that we're all challenged in the same way by these things, not in the same way, sorry, that we're all challenged by these things in different ways, then what else can convince us? Uh, I, I only hope, however, that, you know, there are efforts that exist and that need revitalization. There is a climate uh, action agenda. There is the sustainable development goals. There are tracks that can be followed. Let's see whether political changes in some countries may make it more possible for these common agendas to be pushed forward. Uh, on the... On the Refugee migration side, remember, we, um, I think we had made good progress. We established two compacts. I know one of them, the migration was a bit controversial, but we have those two compacts. And those two compacts are very good tools, very practical global tools to deal with this uh, phenomenon. So perhaps, you know, if, if your question is about, is there a glo global, an understanding that, Globally, we need to embrace together these challenges. That I don't know. And unfortunately, many politicians uh, talk against that, which doesn't make things easier. But then if you look at different initiatives, there is some hope that it requires political investment by the big, big players. Let's see whether 2022 will, uh, will, uh, will, uh, will bring that. Can I say one small thing here, which I think is important? One of the tests, of this uh, approach will be the vaccine. There is no doubt about that. <laughs> the vaccine, you know, I, I, it is inevitable that the vaccine is also a big commercial enterprise, that countries will want to give the vaccine to their nationals first. I mean, that's normal. Let's see whether in parallel there will be an effort also to ensure that those that are not powerful and not rich also can get the vaccine in individual countries and globally speaking. I say this because of course we're fighting for the refugees and the displaced to access the vaccine, but they're not the only ones that risk being excluded if that approach is not global. Thank you, Filippo. Uh, we have a few questions already. Uh, let me see if I manage to read because they are far away on my screen. Uh, one question is from uh, Giacomo uh, and I try to read it. Compared to past years, we are witnessing some timid changes. The European Union is drafting new ideas for more welcoming policies for migrants. Italy has amended the security decrees, although it has, not left, it has left many burning issues open. Could this new scenario also change the policies of the United Nations agencies on the issue of the Mediterranean Sea? Can we expect your agency to be more actively involved in search and rescue alongside NGOs? Um, can I just say that may maybe I would turn the question around. I hope that uh, what we have been saying and pushed for can change the policies of Europe and of the states. It's rather the other way. We're not the ones who have to change our policy. Our policy is quite clear. Now, I think the question is related to the fact that we do not have boats and we do not have rescue. This is not our job, frankly speaking. This is not our job. All I can say here is that, um, and you know, I am on record tens of times having said that rescue at sea is a non-negotiable obligation of states and that if that operation of rescue at sea is... Uh, supported also by civil society, by NGOs, 
that also needs support. And above all, it doesn't need to be penalized or limited, which has happened and is happening all the time. So I, that's, that's my role, I think, as High Commissioner, is to stand up for states and civil society to do this. It's an obligation, but you know, I, I am not going to now start an operation of Rescue at Sea run by UNHCR. This is not, strictly speaking, our job. And I don't think we would have the capabilities of doing that. But advocating, supporting, helping with the policies, absolutely yes. Thank you. Uh, there is a question on Ethiopia. Are there any initiatives ongoing being contemplated by your, or your agency for prevention or minimize the influx from uh, uh, Tigray region of Ethiopia? Unfortunately, difficult because um, we have very limited access, although we are present in Tigray. Remember, in Tigray, um, Tigray even before this conflict, was the um, ho hosted almost 100,000 Eritrean refugees and also had a, a locally displaced population. So we and other organizations were present. Now with the conflict, that presence is a bit more challenging, but we're still there. We have, of course, uh, stepped up very much our preparedness in the country which is most likely to receive refugees if the conflict worsens, which is Sudan, as I said earlier. We have seen now the figures are, are difficult. It was only 7,000 last night. I think it's gone up to 10, 11,000 today uh, uh, in, from Tigray into Sudan. If the conflict continues, we're pretty sure that this is going to rise further. So that's what we're doing now. We are doing very much a, a relief operation, an emergency operation. To, uh, to prevent, unfortunately, the conflict is too late. The conflict is ongoing. Let's hope that the conflict ends soon in a peaceful manner so that people can go back to their homes. Uh, there are many thanks for your answer and your comments, but I will go to only to the questions. Uh, there is one question on, uh, uh, again, on the European Migration and Refugee Pact. Uh, you mentioned that in certain areas, refugees' protection and compliance with, mini, with humanitarian rights might drop to the bare acceptable minimum. What are the areas you have in mind when making this claim? And what do you mean when mentioning the expression bare minimum? Who set the standard in this case? The standards of refugee law are set by my organization, if I may say. We are the custodians of the refugee conventions. And uh, now, states may not recognize, observe, respect them, or yes, that's another matter. Many times they don't, sometimes they do. But we are the ones, in, in, in terms of refugees, you know, this is a complex issue. Migration is a different issue. Internal displacement is a different issue. But in terms of refugee, we have a clear mandate by the international community to set those parameters and to recommend a course of action to governments. This is a big part of our work. It's, it's, it's almost legal in nature, institutional in nature. And what do I mean by standards? You know, I, we do recognize that these are not easy issues. The flows that come into Europe, but not just into Europe, because we're always thinking about Europe, but the flows that go in many directions, think of Central America, think of Southeast Asia, think of Southern Africa into South Africa. Those flows are increasingly mixed. You have refugees and you have people that move for other reasons. And sometimes it's difficult to determine uh, what is the main cause of movement, although there are ways to do it. So this is the difficulty. So we need to be also pragmatic. And this is what we're trying to help government do be as pragmatic as they can, as practical as they can, without violating the fundamental issues. What are the fundamental issues? You know, we go back to the origins here. If you flee, if you escape from a country where there is conflict, or you're persecuted, or discriminated, or suffer violence, or you are, you know, you suffer because of sexual orientation or other human rights abuses, you are entitled to uh, be heard if you ask for asylum and you should not be pushed back to a country where either the country of origin or a country like Libya where you are unsafe. 
So this is the fundamental principles. If, if in being pragmatic, these principles are uh, uh, impacted or eroded, then we are below the, the critical uh, level. Uh, Filippo, you mentioned uh, Africa several times. You mentioned Ethiopia, uh, Congo, Sudan. Monica Maggioni asks, uh, do you see a Europe more aware of the need of a presence in Africa for the future or business as usual? No, I think uh, there is growing awareness. And Monica, we know this very well. Um, it's a bit late, but anyway, better late than never. I am always, you know, hope is always the last one to die. Because frankly, uh, it is very good that the pact, and thank you for this question because it gives me this opportunity. The pact is not only about receiving people. It's also what to do in the countries where they come from or the countries they go through. Libya is the most complicated example, but there's others. And I think that this is where Europe needs to have a very important reflection. Europe gives a lot of money in international cooperation, in aid. Now, um, can part of this money be more strategically used to avoid unnecessary movements? Here I'm talking more on the economic side on the opportunities. Can, can, can countries of transit, don't take Libya because Libya is too complex, there is a war there, but take Niger, for example, Niger, or take um, uh, um, even Chad or even Sudan. Can we do something to help them deal with the people transiting through? Not everybody wants to go and go on a boat and go on a very dangerous journey across the Mediterranean. Many people don't even want to cross the more difficult part of the journey, which is the desert. So maybe they cannot stay in their countries because there is a war or human rights violation, so they have to go, okay. And maybe in that country we can do more to strengthen the way that country hosts these people so that they don't feel the urge or the need to go further where the treatment is better. Of course, there will always be a power of attraction of the richer countries, Europe, but also US, Canada, Australia, etc. That you cannot eliminate completely because that would require equality, an equality in the world that doesn't exist. But you can minimize a lot of unnecessary movement. And I can assure you, for having spoken to so many of these people, many of them would prefer not to have to move and embark on dangerous journeys, but they need opportunities, they need uh, education, schools, and all that. If Europe can be more strategic in the way it deals with that, it would be good. Thank you, Filippo. Hamad is asking, do you think the difference between refugees and migrants is clear in people's minds? I think it is not clear in people's minds. And I cannot blame the people because it is a very difficult distinction, especially in our world in which, as I said earlier, people move together. And the, the togetherness is also due to very tragic aspects of this movement. Remember, so much of it is driven by traffickers, by criminals, and they just take anybody who pays or anybody who is desperate enough to uh, to, uh, to, to sell themselves almost to these people in order to move on. And they are refugees, they are migrants. So that lumps everybody together in the public uh, mind and public perception and makes it difficult. But it is possible. You know, I think I, I can fully appreciate that perhaps, you know, when UNHCR started, which is exactly 70 years ago, next month, 70 years ago, it's not good to be that old, and not for an organization like mine, which should have died many years ago, but unfortunately it's still there. When it was created, it was easier. It was really individuals fleeing mostly from the Soviet bloc into the West. These were the first people that the organization dealt with. And that was pretty straightforward. It has become enormously complicated, but the criteria to define who is in need of what we call international protection, so cannot enjoy anymore the protection of his or her country. And therefore, 
is entrusted to the protection of another country, not to the welfare, to the protection, it's different, that distinction is still possible and we're still working with states in uh, rolling it out. Thank you. Uh, Matilde is uh, asking on uh, Karatepe in Lesbos, uh, which would be the involvement of your agency in the new camp in order to one side monitor the respect of refugees and asylum seeker rights and to ensure that the minimum standard of living are met by Greek authorities in charge of the camp? Uh, well, I, I must say, uh, you know, traditionally my organization has not been operational in the sense of having relief operation, shelter, medicine, food, in Europe, in the European Union. Because, you know, we have limited resources. I, I, I mentioned five billion. Don't, don't have big ideas. Five millions are, are quickly spent when you deal with 80 million people. 80 million people is more than the population of Italy, just to mention one country. So five billion is not a lot. But uh, therefore, we have to prioritize. And frankly, traditionally, we have always prioritized operations in countries that have few resources, not in the European Union, where between the Commission and the member states, they can respond in that respect. But Greece was quite exceptional. Remember, the, the inflow into Greece started in 2015, the big one, the recent one, at a time when Greece was also going through its own huge financial crisis. And my predecessor, who is now the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, he was then the head of UNHCR, he said, let's mobilize to help Greece. So we actually, maybe it's not well known, but we've done quite a lot. We've done quite a lot in terms of relief on the islands, but in particular in setting up accommodation programs on the mainland which is really the most important. We've been trying for a long time to convince the Greek government to move more people to the mainland where conditions are better. So we've done quite a lot. We're actually trying, we were actually trying to step back from that a bit and give back to the, to the Europeans the management of this operation. We're still trying to do that, but uh, I have had very recent contacts with both the European Commission and the Greek government and have assured them that we will continue to be present. Maybe it is more like Matilde's question. We will monitor the protection side, especially for the vulnerable groups. There's a lot of exploitation and abuse that is going on that we need to really do more about, um, minimum standards, et cetera, et cetera. But we will not be, I hope that we will not be uh, involved operationally because I don't think it is the appropriate thing to do. We need to save those resources for other places where they are more needed, but we can maintain a role of monitoring and, uh, and if you will, vigilance, if you wish, alongside the Greek government and the European institutions. By the way, all of this is described in the pact as an example. And I think some of the ideas related to Greece that are formulated in the pact are very good if, if, if Europe and Greece manage to implement it finally, after all these years, it could be a good precedent in case this type of crisis happens elsewhere as well. Filippo, there is a question from Kedar on uh, Hong Kong. There is a, a developing situation in Hong Kong which could have uh, serious uh, uh, consequences if China takes other line. Do you have any comment on the possible outflow of refugees from Hong Kong? Well, you know, um, um, like in any other situation of crisis, should there be an outflow, we haven't seen an outflow, but should they see an outflow, then it depends, of course, where these people would go. And then it would be up to the authority of that particular country uh, to decide on possible asylum um, adjudications, asylum requests. Uh, so, you know, there's not much I can say. Um, uh, of course, uh, we don't comment on individual cases that may have already occurred. This is something we normally don't comment about. All I can say is that um, it, it will depend on the countries that uh, uh, receive these people. And uh, if uh, any of 
the people hypothetically, because I, as I said, we haven't seen this, um, um, uh, make any particular appeal or these countries need our advice or we feel that those countries need to be advised, we'll do it as we always do for any nationality, for any situation. There is a, a, a last question which I would take uh, from uh, Luz Manfrinato. The European Union and Italian policy has had a slow shift from a more humanitarian approach towards uh, border externalization and militarization. What is your opinion on how this has directly shrinked the civil space for society to act upon the migration issue? I have two comments on this very important issue. Number one, uh, I do respect and understand that states want to have efficient controls at their borders. This is not only their right, this is their duty uh, towards their citizens. So that is important. But, um, but two things. One, um, the discussion cannot be only on borders, <laughs> either the borders of Europe or actually, you know, Europe is now very much concerned with borders of African countries in order to, to make them stronger there. Again, fair enough, those countries also need to have good controls because by the way, this is not just about right, migrants, refugees, it's about drugs, terrorists, a lot of other things, right? So that's fine, but please, not only that, in so many times I speak to leaders who, when they speak about managing movements, it always goes back to control. Okay, do your control, but then there is a more proactive, you know, investments in education, in prosperity, in opportunities, all the things that we have. Uh, you know, if you don't do that, you can put as many controls as you want, but they will not function because people will always find ways to go around if they're desperate. The other thing, because, this word was mentioned in the question, externalization. What does it mean? Externalization means that a country says, nobody can come to my territory to ask for asylum. If, you know, we are ready to take refugees that are recognized as such, but this process has to be done in another country. And, uh, you know, we heard it. We heard it. Several European countries have even proposed that this be the system of Europe. There, absolutely we will never never countenance this approach this for me until i am in this position it we will never agree it may happen we will never agree because this is abdicating to uh, being open to the right of asylum and let's suppose that europe does that luckily the pact rejects that as well so that's good but let's suppose that this view prevails what am i going to say to leaders of much poorer countries that have to take one million people because they will tell me, but Europe is not allowing them in, is filtering them before they reach the territory of Europe. So frankly, besides the fact that I think it's completely unfeasible from the practical point of view, no other country will want to be the screening center, right? For Europe or, or others. I really reject it also on the basis of principle. We are close to the end, unfortunately, but uh, I have a final question, Filippo. You are close to the end of your first term as High Commissioner for Refugees. Which assessment of these five years? What has been the greatest challenge? And uh, we know you are very humble, but what the greatest achievement? But uh, I think uh, I don't need to be either humble or not. The greatest challenge is what, by, you know, like these uh, threats to all the questions that we have been receiving, right? The greatest challenge is that a humanitarian narrative in respect of refugees is, has turned into a very politicized one that uh, has stigmatized them. And this is not just bad, bad, full stop, wrong, <laughs> because <laughs> it is completely, completely against any, any principle. But it is also so useless. You know, you stigmatize, you say that refugees 
migrants even, but refugees in particular come here to steal our jobs, to threaten our values, to bring insecurity, which is all wrong, in fact. You say that, you build walls, you push people back at sea, all the bad things that we know, and so on. Have you solved the problem? No. You have not even solved the problem at your borders because the next day it will grow again and come again. You have to really be more strategic. But unfortunately, this discourse, this stigmatizing discourse has made it difficult, even for governments who want to do the right things, to do it because they're afraid of being criticized by the radicals that have this narrative, if you see what I mean, and to lose votes in the next election. I mean, you know, we know that. So that is what has been the biggest, almost uh, moral challenge for me. How do you, how, what words do you use to, to counter that? Because unfortunately, public opinion follows a lot that narrative as well. And I think that the, the biggest success, again, this may sound a bit technical, but this compact that we put together and was approved almost two years ago by the General Assembly, read it if you have time. It's a very short document, a few pages. It's brilliant, you know, it's really a global response to a global problem to answer Paolo's earlier question. And I think that it is simple, it is implementable, it is even politically acceptable to most. So this is, you know, I, I, I've done this work for not only for the last five years, but for more than 30 years. And my ambition has always been, let's uphold the ideals, but let's be practical in the way we go about them, because that's the only way that we can realize them in a very fraught political environment. So the compact is a proposal. What Europe is doing is another proposal. Let's continue in that direction. Thank you, Filippo. It has been extremely interesting, and uh, reading from comments in the chat uh, is not only my opinion. Uh, we wish you all the best for your role and for your organization. You made it extremely clear today also how tough is what uh, you have to do, what your organization has to do, but uh, we know we are in good hands. If there is someone we can, who can get results in spite of the many challenges, that's you with your energy, with your competence, and with your vision. So good luck again, and thank you for being with us again for another, uh, another time at Rome Med 2020. Thank you, Filippo, and thank to everybody who- Thank you. Our conversation. Next year in Rome. Thank you. Inshallah. <laughs>